wrong. Give it a second here. All right, we are live. This is the Goose Group. This is a group, if you guys are just chiming in, that I've been doing some podcasts with, some awesome free-minded thinkers, liberty-minded folks, folks, uh, preppers, agriculture, everything. We're, we're getting into it. So each, each week, we do an episode around a theme, and today the theme is the futility of politics and the utility of community, and we're going to bounce back ideas and talk about solutions. So today... We, uh, our host is Nicole Sauce, and each week we do a different host. We rotate. I hosted, I believe, the first episode. Uh, I forget. I missed the second one, so I don't know who hosted that. But Nicole's our host today. She's going to be the MC, and she's going to uh, help us through this conversation. All right. Welcome, everyone, to Unloose the Goose. Today we have our third episode, and we're talking about the futility of politics and the utility of community. And the whole purpose of today is to talk about real solutions, not just random theoretical rantings, although I'm sure we can do our fair share on doing that, right guys? Yep, and we will. Yep. And we will, but we wanna talk about ways to use our state jujitsu powers to exist in the world we exist in, but step around when we can step around. And today we're gonna start with Jack Spierko from the Survival Podcast talking about a couple of ideas he's had and we'll go from there. Yeah, I want to actually give just a couple of examples. One that I was directly part of that's way outside the system and one that is being used by a lot of people right now in California that's completely inside the system. And just to kind of prime everybody's pump here with some thoughts on this type of thinking, right? So right now in California, for instance, if you want to do Uber or Lyft or anything like that, DoorDash, what have you, it's gotten very difficult because the government in California has made it almost impossible to be an independent contractor. And of course, all the people that drive, well, most of the people that drive for Uber and Lyft, et cetera, are independent contractors. You do Amazon deliveries, DoorDash, Rover, which is where you do like, you know, gig economy, dog sitting, all of that stuff is independent contracting. If you only do it directly with the company, you just get certified or inspected or whatever they want you to do. Well, as soon as I heard that, I was like, well, that shouldn't be a problem if you establish an LLC and you're then you're the sole partner, managing partner in the LLC. Then you have a direct corporate to corporate contract. So I checked it out. It turns out that's what a lot of people in California are doing. So even though the state itself put this impediment in place, it basically is destroying the gig economy. It is the state's system that allows you to get around the state's problem. You're using the state's power against it. Now in California, that comes at a cost and you have a business license and it's much more expensive than it would be, let's say in Texas. And fortune, I mean, fortunately, I don't live in California, but unfortunately, I can tell you that California is a horrible place to do business. Uh, we ran a contracting agency. We had contractors in California. It was a nightmare. But if you want to live there and you want to do the gig economy, you file a piece of paper and all of a sudden you're back in business. Because it's a hurdle, it's actually an advantage. And it's an advantage because now if I'm, a, if I'm an Uber driver in California and I do this paperwork, and there's competition, you know, among drivers for passengers, and there's competition among passengers for drivers, I'm going to get a higher rate, and I'm going to get more fares if I'm out there doing that until everybody catches up. So that's an example of state jujitsu. Another example of state jujitsu is something we did that was totally outside the system. And this is one I was involved with. So we managed a farm for a while up in West Virginia. West Virginia is the worst town or the worst state in the, in the country for raw milk. The, the West, Virginia, West Virginia legislature has done everything they can to make it almost impossible to sell raw milk. And up to the point of you can't do a cow share, where basically that would be like Curtis, Nicole, Xavier, and John all own a cow, and I take care of it for you, and you all get your share of milk every week. That's a workaround a lot of states uh, allow. Another would be I just say, hey, I sell milk for dog food, cat food, pig food, whatever, for pet food. And West Virginia says you can't do that. So because obviously I could say it's for dogs and Nicole could buy it for her dog and drink it and that's nobody's business. So how do you get around that? I mean, that seems like it's pretty ironclad, isn't it? Well, we did. 
we sold our raw milk as a soil amendment. And milk actually is a really good soil amendment. We even included instructions on how to use as a soil amendment. And we advertised it as the freshest milk for a soil amendment you could get refrigerated from the time it came out of a cow. And we even put on the label, it was a violation of state law to use this product in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. And all of a sudden, sell all the raw milk that we want, even in the state that made it as difficult as possible. And I just think there's a lot of things like that. There's a lot of loopholes where people, you know, I talked last week about being the pig versus the cow and the pig always testing the fence. And if, you, if it finds one hole getting out, and people just quit too easily. They quit too fast. And then they think, well, we'll vote harder. And I, you know, kind of on today's subject, voting harder won't work, but using the state's power against it, well, sometimes that works. Yeah. So, to that. Yeah, who wants to go next? I'll, I'll add some. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Did you say you wanted to jump in there, John? No, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll go after you. Um, I, I was, I was going to say there, um, Jack, just kind of going on that. Uh, yes, I agree, and I love the idea of state jujitsu. It's it's much of like the art of war. Sun Tzu is using the it's it's yeah using the en the enemy's energy in a way that doesn't disrupt you. And, and a big part of your ability to do that, say with milk, is that your operation is lean, right? You're like th these kind of things, especially you know, I think going forward as we look about the uncertainty and insanity that's coming. And continuously unrolling every day is we've got to be have that jitsu to mind suit mindset we've got to be lean and having diversified income streams diversified food streams diversified everything in a way so that if one thing doesn't work it doesn't cripple your operation what you did there because you have many sources of income too so what what it's all about is 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 staying that way you know the work i love so much about this kind of similar topic is anti-fragile nasim taleb some of you are familiar because it, it's taking the permaculture idea and making it better resilience is a word that's known in permaculture to 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 move around the power of the state and be sort of an agorist is important but to be anti-fragile and there's so many things and I know some of you guys have benefited from this all this bullshit that's happened this all this lockdown <laughs> stuff and you can do that because you're lean you're thinking on your feet but ultimately you're you're kind of not exposed in one way or the other these aren't monocultures right and so that diversified approach is so important uh and how we operate today being uh getting out of the way of the state at least so that it doesn't railroad us yeah i think there's a switch in your brain and how and perception when you accept that you are solely responsible for taking care of yourself and your family <laughs> yeah and, and you're suddenly you're like there's a million other ways i can make money right now so mm -hmm. john what did you want to add yeah when when jack was giving those examples i didn't understand exactly what y'all meant by state jujitsu at first but when jack gave the examples it all made sense to me the first thing that came to mind was was kratom so i'm in the natural products industry it's not just a natural product it's a natural product that the government hates it's banned in six states you can't accept credit cards so it's been a difficult industry to navigate and when i first started selling kratom it was at this bookstore i operated called brave new books and I would sell someone else's Kratom. So I'd just buy it and we would repackage it and sell it. And actually early on, we were just reselling their stuff. We would buy it in bulk and then resell their label. And I got a call from them and they said, hey, you can't sell our products. We noticed in a video you did that you had our Kratom products next to other health products. Our product isn't for human consumption. And so there are some cities or states where they're like, you can't take Kratom. Kratom is a member of the coffee family. It's a powder. It helps people with stress, anxiety, chronic pain. And they're like, you can't use Kratom for health purposes. Even the FDA doesn't approve Kratom for, as a supplement, right? It's in this like shadowy gray area. And so some people sell the Kratom. It says not for human consumption on the bag. Some people say it's like a foot powder or it's for making okay. soap, right? And so early on, I was going to adopt that strategy to just try to get the FDA to never crack down on me or anything. But I realized that there's this moral hazard that was created because the minute that you put a suggested serving on the bag, then obviously it's something that you're going to consume, which enters you potentially into this regulatory arena at the state level. And the FDA could be like, you're not supposed to sell that as something that you consume. But I had to weigh 
the risk involved with selling it is something that you consume and all my videos and all my marketing, it's like you consume this and it could help you with your health. I'm just putting it out there as an agorist, right? So I either completely avoid that and just say it's just a powder with no suggested serving size. But then the problem is if someone were to buy it and not do the research on what an adequate dose is, they could take too much and have some nausea or an upset stomach and not have a good experience. So because of the state, I decided, you know what? I'm just going to forget the jujitsu. I'm just going out and being a little more blatant with it. But I think the unfortunate thing is that the government has put us in this position where they, the FDA claims they're there to help you, but they've created this moral hazard whereby a lot of Kratom vendors aren't putting suggested serving, which is not good for the consumer. And I think it just illustrates that the FDA isn't really interested in helping people uh, in yeah. the first place. But see, my mind is very much a lawyer's mind. And so I think, how do you do what you want to do and protect yourself? And so what it makes me think is the verbiage would be more like, if you were to consume those, <laughs> then it would than... be a good idea not to exceed, <laughs> you know, this is a trial dose and this is a, a, a full dose. But I would suggest that you don't consume it and you use it for scrubbing your toes, right? Mm -hmm. Like, because people know, what you, it's like when you say, we get in the world of permaculture we and people say, well, I'm going to be a permaculture consultant. I'm like, don't do that. Say you're an edible landscape specialist, right? Because the permaculture person knows this is not a government thing. This is more like, this is a marketing thing, but the permaculturist knows, oh, I know what he does, but all the people that don't know what permaculture means, like still know what you do. So it's a, the reverse concept of that. Like, and I'm not saying you should do that. I'm just saying like from a legal indemnification standpoint, you know, it's like the anarchist cookbook for informational purposes only. Doesn't mean that when it tells you how to build this explosive device, it won't blow up. It just means I didn't say you should do that. Yeah. Right. I'm just providing information. Just for a hobby. I, I mean, I love what you're doing, but I didn't know how much legal uh, risk you were at. Well, I've, I've been okay so far. So there's yeah. that. But I, I prefer to be bold. It's a part of the brand, actually, is that it's like it is. brave be botanicals. Bold. We're brave. It's freedom. We should have the right to consume whatever medicine that we want to. And I don't know, maybe when I scale to a grand size, you know, or there's offices in all states all over the country or something, then maybe. See, that's what, the, that's what Curtis was saying. Like, you don't, if you want to do this, you don't do that. Right, Curtis? Yeah. I mean, that's what you that's were right. saying. Absolutely. Crappy. Not yeah. unless you're real careful Especially right now. It especially right now with all this shit going on. Like, we don't know what the next piece of shit they're going to throw at the wall is. Because that, that's how I've seen this whole thing is just throw a bunch of shit at a wall, whatever sticks, let's go with that. And so they're just throwing everything. So who knows? Don't don't go all in on thing, one right? thing. Anything. Yeah. That's the thing is like, we're sitting here trying to figure Figure out ways to get around the beast, right? This huge monolithic thing that wants to stomp on everybody. And the minute you, it's like we're getting clever and we're going and figuring out this way to get around it, this way to get around it, get out of its, uh, it's out of its maws, you know. But at some point, you just got to be like, fucking stop, right? This is the the unloose the goose. The goose will come and chase your ass and be like, stop, you know, <laughs> honk honk honk, like uh, like. Like, I feel like we're at that point. We're sitting here trying to figure out what's the next bad thing they're gonna do. It's like. Okay, so if you're gonna if you're gonna prescribe to these notions, and we're gonna take care of ourselves, we're gonna be anti fragile, we're gonna be self reliant, and say don't fuck with us. I mean, at some point, someone does, and we're watching it in politics right now, where they're just continuously bashing people and going after them. And like, at what point does that stop? It stops when somebody says, "I've had enough, done," right? But we don't have like the numbers as agorists who are, you know enough to stand up and be like, we need a new system. I mean, we can create that new system. We create it right now. Yeah, we can make that. that we're here for? I've created it. it. Yeah, I have made it. It just needs to get launched. It has the right amount of people to, to buy into it and see the vision and understand where we're going. The, the question is, is like, how do we protect ourselves through that infancy stage and not let them fuck with us? You know, the guys wanted to go in and, you know, uh, seasteading and all of these different opportunity zones. It's like, I'm personally of the the mindset that we have to be a bunch of ants coordinated, like Jack says, you know, from around the planet in a virtual nation that we don't call it a nation. We don't call it like, because all the Bitcoiners will fucking know what that means. But yeah. everybody else who we need, yeah. to, you know, that's like the Bitcoin spaces. Everybody's like at each other and they're like, yeah, we've got the new product for you, Bitcoiner, and nobody else cares, right? So we need to breach into that greater uh, awakening of people who really prescribe to this. They just don't know how yet or, or why. So See, if you think about it, 
um, the title of this being Futility of Politics and uh, the Utility of Community, you're kind of transitioning there. I, it made me think of, do you guys know John Moody? He runs a grocery cooperative in Kentucky. And they, all of their members, the whole mission is to get their hands on healthy food. Right? Healthy food includes raw milk, Jack. Yeah. And they got raided by the FDA because they were distributing raw milk to the cooperative members. And rather than put their tail between their legs and figure out how to label it is for animal use. He got goosey. A, yeah, he sent an email <laughs> to all the members and said, tomorrow when they come back, I need you to be here. And you sign this thing about, you know, you're going to have your raw milk. And they pushed back. I mean, they looked at the legality, but they had them sign a waiver and people showed up and the feds went away. Yeah. yeah. So guys, so this there is, is a, a trend to, to activate your community when yes. you figure out that you're on the wrong end of whatever that is, you know, whatever person yeah. has to stick up their butt that day at the, at your state inspection office and, and push back. Cause when they're facing down one guy, they don't care when they're yeah. facing back a hundred guys, yep. they care. Yeah. But they so, are like bullies too. And Jack, one re re real quick thing. Yeah. The trend here is private, private yeah. clubs, private members. I exactly. saw a flyer, it went viral. I don't know if you saw this one, Jack, but it was some restaurant in Texas, like some some bar, uh, grill place, some bar, barbecue place, smokehouse. And it was like, uh, whatever our restaurant, it, bucks, it was like bucks four by four or something like this. We are now a private members club. And basically they say, if you feel that you have to, uh, we, well, we're not enforcing masks. This is in the private. So you're yeah, welcome yeah. to come in, but yeah. you must know that these are the, these are the rules of our private members club. That's how we get everything. We go into the private Bitcoin is private. All these cryptos, most of them are private, you know, CSAs yep. for farms. It's about going into the private, even on the sovereign side, man. That's what happens when somebody get, pulls themselves out of the matrix. They go into the private. The public is the beast fucking system. The private is where men and women roam. That's what it's about. It's the private. So two things are, no, well, actually three. First, I'm glad you're the first one to drop an F-bomb in this episode so I can stop taking the heat for it. <laughs> Wait a minute. I said like four of them. All right. I didn't notice. Jack like, had him in the pre-show. Like, like Xavier is smooth with his fucks. He's got the smooth fuck. Anyway. <laughs> He's a smooth fucker. You guys are making he me is. blush here. You're making me blush. <laughs> so anyway, like, so first of all, with the whole like standing up and all and being a goose, like, so the first thing the goose does is it tries to put its babies and its nest out of the way. Right. And that's the whole positioning thing. But yeah, like we've all seen a video where the cows get too close to the goose nest. And there's like a, a herd of cows and the fucking goose is biting the cow in the head. Like, that's a thing too. So I'm big on the pushback and get down the way. Now, what Curtis brought up with the private club, that's actually an old status jujitsu here in Texas. Not that long ago, because I can't be that old. But so back when I first moved to Texas in the early 90s, there were a shitload of places around here where they were still had like a basic form of prohibition against alcohol in restaurants and bars. And they, they, they had dry counties where, like, well, you could get beer or liquor at the liquor store, maybe, or maybe you had to go to the next county or whatever. But whatever it was, you couldn't sell somebody a burger and a beer at, at a sports grill, which is insane. Well, they came up with the idea of a private club. And the counties were like, well, we can't really tell a private club what to do. So some genius, and this guy needs a Nobel Prize, came up with something called the fucking Unicard, Right. The Unicard was a thing that you made a mass club that any bar or restaurant could join. And then you That's were a member of the organized. Unicard. You were a member of all, the, and it could be anything from Joe Blow's burger joint to an Applebee's. And you'd go in, they're like, yeah, we're a private club when it comes, when it comes only for the alcohol. Here's my Unicard. Yep. And your whole table was a guest. And that Unicard was $5 for three years. Dude, five dollars for three years amazing and eventually it actually killed all of this stupidity because the counties were like well we could issue them a permit and we could have the money and and we can't really do anything about it so i think like the pushback is great but it's also like position first and push back when you have to 
So check yeah. this out. What if you were an international organization and everybody were co-owners of a cooperative, a private membership cooperative, and you wanted to import stuff that was made in Timbuktu, right? And you wanted to bring it here okay. and you don't have to deal with all the import taxes because it's your own private company and everybody has their own. It, it's like your own. Does that company. actually work? That doesn't sound like that works. I love it. There might be some international laws. There, there's a there's a problem with a lot of. So How do you I, jack with customs? I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, that's a tough that's right. a good so if, cookie to crack. But if you're bringing if you're bringing equipment from one country to another country to build something, right? Okay. And you're building it in the country, then okay. you don't have all of the import export law taxes because it's internal to your own company. You own so a company in this. Let me country let me make sure I understand you because I think all of us are like going. This sounds really great, oh but does it work? Right? Okay, so you're saying Italian let's say olives. that there is a plant in China that builds excavators, and I have a construction project, and I'm building a campus for my office campus, and I'm bringing that machinery in not to sell it. I'm bringing it in to build my campus. There's a workaround. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. And that's and real. There's, a, there's some jujitsu there that somebody verify that, this that, yeah we're gonna need to or <laughs> but from what i did my research when i was building fire on i said holy sh like when i came across it i was like holy shit we could get this workaround on a global level if we had a global network and then yeah because because check this out i don't know if you guys know this but the u.s government brings their drugs their their uh, uh cocaine prescriptions are we're no, losing we the oh, we lost that's them. Them. Yeah, see that too, they know they got them. Matrix, they Hawk, know. you just so got silenced. There, you have to repeat. Had a glitch. Whoa, 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 whoa. You got a glitch. There are two tribes, two Native American tribes in the United States. The Mohawk in North uh, New York and the Apache in Southern Arizona. And they are on the border of Mexico and Canada, respectively. The U.S. Army brings their drugs through the Apache Reservation from Mexico and the Mohawk Reservation in New York, and they don't have to pay their taxes on it because it's the native tribe so if there's a workaround for that there is definitely a workaround for what we're talking about for the freedom tribe that's curtis's the, thing and learning the from the goose tribe absolutely there's this fallacy that i often rebut when people are doing i think a lot of what what curtis does with the whole privacy and the common law and commercial code type stuff i don't know if that's ex his exact stick but the fallacy is the um is uh, the ought is fallacy and so one thing that we all need to be aware of and be cautious of this is why i always fall back on strength in numbers because even if we utilize this legal loophole or even if according to this ucc or according to like the right to travel for example the supreme court says this you don't have to have a driver's license unless you're engaged in commerce, which is the movement of, of goods or persons for a fee. So when you're in your private right. automobile, you're not engaged in commerce. So I've you're tried this in the courts. You give it to the cop, though, you are. Yeah, That's right. Work. I've done this in the courts without the license, and my tags were expired, so I don't know if I was, was still under it. But whenever you, there's a, oftentimes that even though that's the way things ought to be, according to the law, and yeah. this whole bit of jurisprudence doesn't necessarily mean that's the way things are, because we all know that the government doesn't always follow the law. So we always right. have to be ready to count, like be ready to counter when the government still doesn't do the right thing, even though we found the perfect loophole or Curtis Stone did the perfect legal research and conveyed it perfectly and didn't walk up to the judge and stand up, so on and so forth. They still have more guns and they still have oh, a at lot the end of, of the day, that that's absolutely it. At the end of the day, it's a gang. Uh, but you, it's important to distinguish legal and lawful, right? Mm -hmm. We do not have rule of law. In the de facto world, the America, the, U, the United States is a corporation. 1871 Act is what made the United States an, a corporation. In that legal system, that corporate system, there's what it's things according to statute. It's it's benefits and privileges provided to you. Common law is divine right, God's like what your rights by God, right? What what is right and what is legal are not the same thing. What is illegal and what is wrong are not the same things. It's important to distinguish that when you're when we're talking about this because we don't have rule of law. We have rule of force. You know, Jack and I have riffed on this for hours uh, in previous podcasts. It, the state is just a coercive agency. And so you got to be smart. It's good to know little things uh, like you, you seem to know some of that, John, about about 
tricks you can do and how jurisdiction works and all that. Uh, but at the end of the day is a gang. But also the government is also, in my opinion, like a schoolyard bully. The schoolyard bully, like I had him when I was in elementary school, they'd come and like hit you once, right? And if you never hit back, they'll hit you again. And if you mm -hmm. didn't hit back, they'll hit you again. Yeah. If they hit you and you turn around and knock him in the head, he'll never touch you again, most likely because it's not worth the effort. At the end of the day, they're a gang. And so if you know what you're doing, that can do, that can do a lot for you. But at the end of the day, you don't want to make massive sacrifice and jeopardize your well-being, your family life, and, and your, you know, your yeah. living. You well, I, I think the whole point of state jujitsu, jiu I can't even say that word, is that you're finding that balance between the reality of the wor world that we're in, which has a government and has police and has FDA inspectors who are scarier than the police, and they enforce their policies and that's the reality the other reality is what's right is i should be able to eat whatever the fuck i want to eat it's my choice <laughs> it's my body and so if i can find a way to push back that's great and as john said when i have a community that will come and support me when that's i'm pushing back it's even better it's it reminds me of I can't remember his name. There was a farmer in Michigan who, when the USDA came on to inspect his cattle, came on his property, he was like, fuck that. I know the constitution. Wait right here. They're like, okay, we'll go sit in our car. It's a really cold day. He's like, no, wait right here. I'll go get the things. You cannot come into my house. And he went in his house and made a coffee and sat down and talked to his wife for a while. And they're out there without their coats on, freezing their butts off. Mm -hmm. And eventually, an hour later, he came out and said, here's my piece of paper. And every time they come in, his theory is, if I don't let them on, I'm okay. Right? Because the minute you let an inspector on, the minute you let anybody onto your property, yep. that's when they start finding violations. That's when you get the citations. And that's when they come after you. The risk there, though, is that they may decide to come on anyway and get the sheriff to help. He's in an area where the mm -hmm. sheriff is not willing to come on and help them. Same thing. So there's a lot of like your community mm -hmm. and the relationships, not only with people who care about whatever your issue is, be it food freedom, be it putting the herbs in your body you want to put in your body, whatever it is. Um, if your sheriff, your local law guy is not supported it's a lot harder than if the sheriff is supportive so having those relationships outside your agorist community is also important i think we yeah. forget that sometimes and we go out we poke them in the eye a little too much mm -hmm. and yeah then we're fucked when when we need some sort of reasoned response to something yeah, I want everybody to be careful. Like, so I don't know if everybody here is familiar with a woman named Sherry Jackson. Sherry Jackson was a former IRS agent that has made a career out of telling people they don't have to pay their income tax. And Sherry Jackson was eventually convicted on a very small misdemeanor, federal misdemeanor. Now, if you or I or Xavier Curtis, John, and Nicole get convicted on a misdemeanor of this level, even federal, even if we do get any kind of jail time, because it's so low, low level, even though it's a federal offense, we won't go to a federal institution. We'll go to like county jail and county jail will like within like two weeks, figure out how to get rid of us because they have housing problems and all on this low level misdemeanor. She went to like a medium security federal penitentiary and the judge at center there said, you can't tell people this. So he convicted her of something, but he justified the sentence based on something that she wasn't convicted on. And that is the, the bully and how much power the bully has. So like you talk about punching the bully in the face, that works. It also, at times you punch the bully in the face and the bully punches you in the throat. Yeah. You have to you be pick careful and that's what yeah, you have to pick your, your battles. battles. And you mentioned Sun Tzu. So Sun Tzu said you never fight a battle you know unless you can't your win. victory is assured. So Absolutely. you choose the location and the timing of the battle. And right. you choose who was with you in that battle. Because if you just go off half cocked, you're probably going to get your throat punched. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, dude, and that's kind of what Nicole was saying, though, too. When she, when she was talking about yeah. the guy came out with the paperwork, he now reset the terms, right? And this even happens when you really get into – 
all the crazy stuff that goes on in courts. I've listened to so many hours of court stories, but it's you keep you, it's a keep it, they keep resetting the stage. They reset the stage. They adjourn the court. Comes back in a di different jurisdiction. This <laughs> happens in many other aspects of everything we do. We reset the terms. You know, so much of it goes down to this. In my for me, it's a spiritual thing. It's it's this. I'm the creator. We create all the, I call them the connivers, the the connivers of the guy, these, these, these cronies that rule the world, right? These guys don't create. They just trick us to create things for them. And it's, parasites. you know what I mean? And we got to remember that we're the creators. We set the terms, right? We, we can do anything we want, but we got to be smart. We got to know what we're doing. And yeah, like Jack says, you're, you're right. You can hit back and you can get knocked in the head of the lead pipe. That's right. You got to own your consequences. You got to take accountability for knowing or not knowing that that fight was going to be way outweighed, you know. And so like what Jack was saying, you know, that was the uh, the woman who was cutting hair, Jack. And you pointed out like, oh, she must have planned this out. You yeah, know, yeah she did. Something. Yeah, she of was course. Totally, and she had a sleep well problem behind her. Yep. Yep. So it, it's it's that sort of thing is like, OK, the, the bully will keep coming so long as you keep dodging and finding different ways to get around it. It's only when you come back with force and, and truly have the force. And that is the, the, the will of the people. But how do you manage a large group of people like that? It, it, after a certain, you, you even said this last episode, after a certain amount, people start splitting. You know, mm -hmm. there's the, the ones who take care of the system and the ones who expand it. And then it always ends up unbalanced to the ones who take care of the system. So there has to be like that cognizance. And how do we not govern, but come to consensus in a reasonable way that matches our See, he says smart stuff. And he says and then he matrixes out. It's like a big yeah. conspiracy. There's like or a Max, it's North Carolina. The, the Max Headroom thing going on there. Right? Oh my god! Remember Max oh. Headroom? Oh, he's back. Oh, yeah, cool. he's so good. I'll tweet my thing. I mean, do you use yeah. Dropbox and is it syncing? That's what I want to know. You know, here, here's my 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 thing that we I think we need to ask ourselves in this. So it's like another point of discussion. Are we underselling the power of agorism? Do we not understand, like, because I, I hear almost a weakness in some of this. And I think that this group, this community, when I say, you know, the, the, the agorist community, I think it's actually the strongest community in the world. We just don't know we're a community. And I think that the government is terrified of us. And the way you know that is that the whole thing is like, you know, when you're over the target, that's when the enemy starts shooting at you. The people that they always go after, or agorist, even if like you could ask this person, like, are you an agorist? They go, what the, what's, what the hell is that? They don't have any idea. But every drug dealer, right? Every drug Dude, dealer. Most farmers, most farmers are most agorists. Farmers, well, the like, path of least resistance, right? This is a natural yeah. state of humanity to exchange goods and services. Have any of you ever been to like a big meeting at a hotel where there was some kind of community going on where there wasn't a group of tables in the back selling shit? And yeah. do you think those people really paid taxes <laughs> on the stuff that they were selling? Do you really? Hell like, no. Right. So like, this is something like, and, and that thing could have been about like, I don't know the best place to find doilies for your bed or some shit. And they still did it. Like, this is a natural state of human beings. This, this is not something you become. It's something you discover that you are yeah. because most people are. When I was a kid, my first job, I worked for a guy. You can't make shit up like this. His name was Muskrat Purcell. He ran a junkyard. I pulled parts off of junk cars. I hardly ever saw the guy. I'd go in, there'd be a list where the cars were. I'd go out, I'd pull all the shit. I'd put it in bins and there'd be a, a thing in the drawer and there'd be money in the bottom of the drawer. And it was for last week. And I would you know, put notes down. I got all this stuff. Here it is. This part was actually bad, whatever. And next week there'd be a new envelope with money and a new list of shit to do. And I was growing up around all these people that were like Kennedy Democrats, man, you know, union and, and, and everything. And they said, who, who, and I was like 15 years old. Well, who are you working for? Muskrat, you doing it under table? Yeah, good boy. Hit you in the back. <laughs> like, so they should be against this, but they were all for it because this is a natural state. And yeah. I think what we, don't, we need to do is we don't need to create this community. We just need to make this community aware of what they are and, and unite them in purpose. Go ahead, yeah. I got a um, I, I got a tactic that I could recommend to people that's had I've had some luck and you brought up Sherry Peel Jackson and I was thinking of Joe Bannister is another guy Ed and Elaine Brown they up in New Hampshire they actually had a big community that were there supporting them but they still the feds came in with helicopters and stuff and I think one of them's died in prison the other one might still be in prison but not to 
preface what I'm about to say with that, but one good tactic, which is uh, from America, Freedom to Fascism by Aaron Russo. That was a great film that woke a lot of people up. Was Man, uh, that woke me up a long time ago? Yeah, that's, that's a good one. A, everybody, that everybody, sound off. Was that a wake up for you? It was for me. Man, amazing. It was amazing. good. Yeah. Nicole yeah. doesn't watch movies. Nicole's so I like, I don't know what the hell. <laughs> it's I worth read it. books. It's okay. He's yeah, good. Yeah. I mean, it was another in a long line of stuff, but it was show me the law, right? And so back to the, when, when I was running this bookstore, Brave New Books, we would serve Kratom shots and we'd sell them for like $4 or something. Someone could just take a single serving. Well, the health and human service department, the local thugs came down and tried to shake me down. They said, if you're serving these Kratom shots, then you need to get a permit to operate as a food and beverage business. And I was like, wait a second, that doesn't sound right. Show me the law. Most people just say, oh my God, the health and human services here. What can we do to appease them? They just lay down. But I think pushing back, even, you know, don't, you don't have to put yourself at risk, assess the risk, assess what could happen. But the initial pushback could just be like that. that I don't understand. Right. There, there, that's some language too, Curtis. I don't stand under, right. I don't understand. You show me the law. Yeah. And so they showed me the law. They didn't even know what it was. They had to get the city legal department on. (laughs) And it said something where if you're serving things like an open container, then you have to get a permit. So I just simply went and got this really small um, jar. What are the jars called? The uh, mason mason jars, a really small mason jar with a little lid that just locks on and does pressure. And so we started serving them in this little lid and they still came back. And I was like, now, hold on a second. This isn't, (laughs) this is, this is pre-packaged. This is already packaged before we give it to the customer. It's in a package. That was the thing. You can't do pre can't do unpackaged goods. Then you have to do it. And at the end of the day, because we pushed back, because I sat them down and recorded them and me and my staff were sitting there across the table from them. And because they were like overwhelmed and didn't even know, I knew the law better than them after one evening of research searching it they ended up never coming back and it's Dude, just that initial incredible. pushback and kind of that's, just forced awesome. their hand so and that's a loophole back. right that they may if they get mad at you they may try to write that loophole out but there are a gajillion loopholes like that in yeah. the food law food law mm-hmm. being where my heart is so you know what i always tell people example. with that stuff don't be intimidated by these documents you know somebody from one of these blah 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 agencies will reach out to you look it up First thing I do is I go to the definitions. Like, for example, I'll give you one cl- mm-hmm. classic example. I found a way out for so many farmers is we have this Marxist land grab happening here in British Columbia called the Agricultural Land Reserve. And they have the Agricultural Land Commission. And they've been making so many farmers life hell on earth for a long time, cost people millions of dollars. Uh, I went into the, the act. And the first thing I looked for was the definition of farm. There was none. Then I looked for a definition of farmer. There was none. None. Then I looked for a definition of um, person. And their definition of person was includes a First Nations government. Now, in legalese, includes means that only that. Inclusio is the, 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 the maximum of that word is the inclusion of one is the exclusion of everything else. So it said includes the First Nations government. So this document, who are they talking about? They're talking about somebody that has, they don't have jurisdiction over basically, because I'm not a First Nations government as a farmer. Nobody I know is. So there's remedy in all these things. You just have to look and you can ask them. So they're making the claim to have jurisdiction over you. You ask them. I'd be happy to go along and bend over and let you have your way with me upon presentation of a bona fide claim that states where you get your authority from, what you define as a person, whatever it is. There's so many loopholes in their documents and it almost seems like, I'm not saying that it is, but it almost seems like a conspiracy because they, it's a sick joke for these guys and they think it's so fun. You have to be so stupid to go along with it that you deserve to get hosed by it because you didn't even read the first page of definitions that gave you a way out. It is like a con, it's a con, they're con men. We're sitting here with five geese talking about real solutions to problems. Let's think about a problem communally that we have that needs I, to be solved. I just got asked one by our live viewers on YouTube. And it oh, was what's from, that? yeah, it's Glad from- somebody's monitoring that shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I made uh, Xavier an admin. I'm in here too. Oh, All right, magic. cool, cool. It's a uh, uh, Daria- I can't even find it. <laughs> Karamishev. Dar- Daria Karamishev asks, what is the best currency for an alternative community in your opinion, except for barter? And would obviously be earth credits and Phyron, but I want to hear what everybody else has to say. 
That's, that's a great question. Because I think it, ha it has a lot of utility in where things might go immediately. For sure. I think I, I got a buddy. I'll, I'll leave some of this. I, I want to hear Xavier's thoughts on this too, because he's, he's a really, really into this stuff. But a friend, a friend of mine has, has a wise saying, the more ways you have to get paid, the more you get paid. So if the question is, what currency do we use in a community? The answer, in my opinion, is everything and all of them. All. But with less preference on fiat dollars. Bitcoin. I love silver rounds. Silver rounds would be a great way to trade. I mean, because as long as you're within the margin of, you know, today it's worth 39 bucks in Canada. As long as you're within the margin, it's like, whatever. Use that. You, you, you can make a local exchange trading system so easily. Create a public ledger. And if, it, if it's in a community of 50 people, it works so easily. It's called a, a, a let's, right? People have been doing this for hundreds of years. And you just have a ledger and people say, I did this for you, you owe me that. That goes into the ledger, right? That's how the Ripple cryptocurrency was originally started. That's what it was supposed to be, was basically just a public ledger to lend out your promises to pay to people you know. Yeah. So it can be anything. Correct. That is correct. Yep. And I mean, they, they did Ithaca dollars. There's a whole bunch of really great things. But it, it, back to Curtis, it's like, whatever you have that works, right? Until that there are real good uh, solutions because Bitcoin's not a great solution. Litecoin isn't, Bitcoin cash isn't because all of these things are trading and they're volatile. And so you, you, you don't want to use them. They, it lowers what's called the velocity on the currency, which is the, the speed and rapidity which it goes through different merchants. So people actually want to hold on to it. So it slows it down and it becomes a store of value and it fluctuates based on everybody's treating it as a security. So none of them are great because you go buy a pizza for 10,000 Bitcoins and then five years later, that was a $20 million pizza. You know what I mean? So That's great if you sold the pizza. pizza. And held it. And but, held yeah, it. Of course. Yeah. But the, the, you, even just the promissory note or just like, a, like hours, right? Like I did this much work and it's worth this much. Like it doesn't matter. It's just the honor that you have between the other individual and yourself. Yeah. Well, Some of the hours-based systems, this, I, I would caution against it. That's an hour-based system. Unless you're all egalitarian and want to roll like that, um, some, like the doctor's hour who has been in practice for 35 years is more valuable than the doctor's hour who just got out of med school. So there needs to be some way to account for that, which you could simply charge multiple hours or someone owes more in the ledger system. But I would caution against that egalitarian thing because that's like a disincentive for people to exceed or to get their extra accreditation or something. Uh, absolutely. But then I think you're back to the the more me, the more way. So if, if Curtis wants to exchange his hours, fine. I, I'll tell you, an hour of my consulting is really freaking expensive, man. I mean, you know. Uh, so in fact, I don't even want to do it. So I make it more expensive. So you won't there ask you me, right? <laughs> but but like. Um, like I, I kind of wish Vin was here because Vin can speak to this more than me, but I have a cursory understanding. So maybe it's not so much the currency itself, but the structure. So there's something within the crypto world called simple ledger protocol. And what that actually allows for is multiple payments in a single transaction. Mm. So that if the community had a coffee bar and there were multiple providers to that coffee bar, Nicole's providing them coffee. Somebody else is providing them cookies. Maybe they're Kratom cookies. I don't know if that's a thing or whatever, but <laughs> what, what have you like, so what thing. happens is, <laughs> so Curtis walks in and he pays in Bitcoin cash or Bitcoin or, or I don't give a shit, whatever it is, as long as it works with SLP. And so he buys this from John and all of a sudden Nicole and Xavier get paid when that transaction happens and nobody actually does anything. And if somebody from the uh, department of making you sad walks into this place that, that Xavier's running. Right. And he says, well, who works here? And Xavier goes, nobody works here. Well, who owns the place? I yeah, lease it from a guy. Well, yeah. how do you pay him? I don't really pay him. I don't know how he gets paid. Well, <laughs> Like, so, I mean, at this point, like, so the guy that owns the building is getting paid for each transaction, too, in some micro piece of that. And this all happens instantaneously. But if Nicole works there cleaning up the tables or whatever, and she's in for a piece of this, and they go to Xavier and they say, hey, Xavier, like, she's your employee? And you're like, no, she isn't. I don't well, have anything to do with that. I, yeah. He's gotta have go to her tables for coffee. And he, he, they go, what are you doing? You go, I just clean this stuff up because I don't like to. Do you get paid? I don't know. Right. And like, prove it. So show me the law. Show me the proof. 
Show me the trans. There's no transaction here whatsoever. This guy comes in and puts space credits out in the outer space. I don't get them. Like this thing goes around a back end. It comes back and splits itself up. Like, I don't, I don't know this the way Vin does, and it's too bad he's off. I don't know spearfishing tonight or whatever, or taking care of a client. Well, this, well, right. this question has come up on social about 900 times in the last three weeks, so I'm sure it'll come up when he's here, Jack. Okay. Yeah, yeah I mean, I'm sure we're going to hit it again. But I'm back you know to what the first answer it? Curtis gave was all of them. Yeah. <laughs> so this, this all all the best one, that's and why. And don't yeah. underestimate the power of direct barter. That's the other yep. thing. Is it Which seems- is absolutely... It right. seems impractical, yeah. right? But like, totally. I, I just traded the install of a tankless hot water heater for web work. Done. Well, that that never happened, right? No he taxes. Ortiz's question. He says, what good is crypto if the government pulls the plug on the net? Or if there's an EMP, China, whatever, yeah, that yeah, electricity yeah. goes out. You what if know your aunt has going. balls? Right, exactly. Well, but, but <laughs> Xavier, I want to hear, I know you have a solution for that one. I thought about you when I saw that question. Yep. <laughs> Um, what if, <laughs> what if your aunt has what if the internet goes down? Oh, I mean, what if the internet, oh, goes, okay. down? What if the internet goes down? Well, I mean, was like, yeah, yeah, I'm like, what I've if got my a hard wallet, a hard yeah. crypto wallet, right? So, um, no, if, if the crypto, the crypto wallet should sustain if there is an EMP tech because they're solid state for the most part. If you've got a problem with the internet and electricity as a whole, you're fucked and like you're talking 10, 20 Your years. dollars are useless too. Right? Yeah, exactly. you're screwed. So that's Bitcoin's where, the least of our worries. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I, that's what I told all my friends who were, you know, preppers and all of that at the time. I'm like, well, that's why I've got whiskey, bullets, and gold. Yeah. You know, yeah. Don't so, Everyone thinks it's either or. They're always like, well, we need to have our gold and our guns. And it's like, a, yeah, and- A good investment point. portfolio includes bullet, gold, and guns. That's I'll right. just say ATF, people are like, what does alcohol, tobacco, and firearms have in common? They're your three barter items. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Anyway, Xavier, Other things you want to have. No, it's yeah. true. I mean, like the, the local convenience store, which is like, I think I told you guys on the first episode, they sell feed, food, guns, and convenience store items and gas and all these other really great things for homesteading. They're out of bullets. Five, five, six, they can't get them. And I've called around and there's like none of it around. And they're saying because it has to do with the iron mines in China or something. So we're already looking at supply chain issues. If you just look hard enough, you know, so what, yeah. what are you, you going to use as barter and trade? Danielle, well, dude, Wilson. I mean, come on, we're missing the elephant in the room there. Here, it's food, obviously. Yeah, somebody's right. saying yeah. that in the comments. Sure, That's guns or whatever is great, but how long can you hold out on the hill? Like, yeah. this is the thing: if 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 shit goes really bad, and um, you know, the, the the old the old crusty guy that nobody likes but has all the guns, he can only take it so far. Either you're the guy who's out murdering people, and that's not going to last long because somebody's going to take you out, or you're just the paranoid guy up on the hill hunkering down but you know if you're not in the community and this is where i want to bring it back to where we came to from this the utility of politics the utility of community is that if you're not in the community and people are like you know what that nicole woman i would i would help her out because she's helped me out a lot right that guy jack I would have his back because he's done this for me and and we do we we help each other right we're communal animals we need each other that's what's so insane about all this lockdown and masks and bs yeah. is like it seems like it's just meant to pull us away from each other our humanity is w- within each other it's in our heart yeah. in our hands right and Social we have to hold each other and we do that uh metaphorically and literally we hold each other up in the community right and that's that's where if you when the shit hits the fan if people are not invested in their community it, you can only hold out on the hill for so long. Yeah. But what about yeah, ideology? ideology? What's that, Xavier? What about ideology? So I'm on the board of my kid's school, and they want to wear masks at a, at a school that's based on the philosophy of freedom. And I'm it's saying, insane. well, I, I'm, that's what I said. I'm like looking at the facts. They get government do- dollars. That's why. No, no, it's private, dude. Yeah, but they and, probably still get funding, dude. That's probably that's why they're pandering to this shit. I'm no, on the board. no, there are. No, they're just probably, scared of the virus. They are, are enough to uh, or it's legal virus. liability. That it's legal that, liability. That's right. where the private. If it was really private, you could get around that. Well, we're gonna have like a big community discussion. Not if the, not if they don't want to, Curtis. Yeah. That's well, that's well. Yeah. This yeah. problem isn't him. him. It's yeah. not regulation. It's yeah. the majority of the people involved have decided we're they're gonna scared. mask our children. My response to that would be, well, fuck you, my kid's out. 
I yeah, mean, that, my I, wife, that's 100%. my yeah. 100%. I'm, I'm of that. And that's what I said the first thing. I was like, that's it. We're not going back. And yeah. But it's more nuanced because it's community. And then you have to be yeah. really, really fucking diligent about who you choose to be your community because there, there is a lack of courage there, a lack oh. of reason, and a lack of, like, courage. Like, I look at this and I can, like, Jack knows. It's like, look at the evidence. Come on. But Dude, not enough people absolutely. do. Absolutely. And, and so... Good. You know, so my, like my thing is when that happens in a like, community, we're outnumbered. you know, we talked about leadership last time. So that to me, that's when you do step up as a leader and say, I don't think we should do this. Well, we're going to do this. Okay. That's what I'm going to do. God bless you. Good luck. I'm going to go over here and not do this. If you'd like to come with me, come with me. And if I'm there by myself, at least I'm not masking my child and abusing my child. And if three people come with me, then it's three people. And I, you know, on the occasion when the majority come with you, maybe the minority go, uh maybe this wasn't such a good idea yeah. and then maybe they don't but that's the free that's the free market of ideas and i don't actually have a problem with the fact that if it really is private that your people want to do this stupid shit i because they have every right to do stupid shit it's their kid i have no right to tell them what to do with their children but i am then going to withdraw my child and Absolutely. tell them to go and not pay the shove your head as tuition. far up your ass that's as you right. can and inhale I mean, that's <laughs> that'll protect you from the virus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Hawk's starting a private school at his homestead, apparently. I mean, I've already Academy. 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 Offer me. the Hawk Academy. I love People it. They've already offered me. They're like, I'll pay you two fifty a week, and I was—I remember Jack saying that. I was like, Dang, Ooh. enough people. I mean, business. Why not? Yeah. When you brought up ideology, what Im immediately came to mind for me was I used to be really strong ideology. Uh, and just like, I need to get my little libertarian crew. But then I realized like, I'd rather be friends or go have a beer with the socialist that's friendly than a libertarian a-hole. And there's a bunch of those. Oh yeah. But you bring up a good point. It, and I think that it all comes out to like concentric circles. So in your inner cadre, that's the language you use for the freedom cells in the inner cadre, you want those people to be on the same page. You want them to be extremists when it comes to freedom, right? But on the periphery, peripheral, the other farms, the other, you know, the left leaning police accountability group or the per, a lot of permaculture folks are, are more left leaning. A lot of folks that are doing the gardening. It's and an unfortunate truth. Uh, but we're going to infect them, not with the virus, though. But it's OK that they have that ideology over there and we could trade amongst them. But I think what you said, like it is important for our core group and those that we're closest with it's really important for them to really understand freedom because when you have some peaceful with some socialist tendencies, then they're willing to sick the government on you. But even in the intergroup, like outside of the government, like you said, this is a private organization. It's not government forcing everything, but because they're okay with controlling people and because they're not fully bought into the whole natural health philosophy that like maybe the virus will come and go maybe we can get the antibodies or whatnot, then it's a problem. So I'm glad that you brought that up. I had that little struggle in my head, like, oh yeah, we need to have a big tent, but at the same time, the big uh, tent comes with risk. Big no, we have we don't need a big tent. We need group. an open tent. Yeah. You're yeah. welcome. Yeah. But if it's too small for you to get under, piss off elsewhere kindly. I mean, like th this idea that we need to be welcoming to everybody, that's that's the ideology of the politician. The, totally, because he wants tent. the votes. Yeah, I got to make sure I don't offend too many people. I want to offend as many people as possible as, fast, them out. as fast, fast as I can yeah. so Absolutely. that they'll all identify themselves so I know who they are and they'll all stay away from me. That's what a goose, totally. the goose does not worry about offending you. The goose will take a crap on your house as it flies over it and tell you, sorry, I had to take a dump. Now, I'm not <laughs> advising we do that. I'm just saying that's kind of the, the attitude of like, this is what I believe, and I do not ask you to believe it too. I do not ask you to even be part of it. All I ask you to do is honor what I want in my life and stay the hell out of my way. And I am, if you want to have the most r ridiculous government in your life possible, and you want them regulating when you can take a crap, I'm okay with that as yeah. long as you don't make me have to participate in it. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and that way, it, it's going to actually make it, and this is the difficult thing for anarchists, libertarians, et cetera. We all feel that way, whether we express it that way or not. And that means that we all, everybody here right now disagrees on a hundred things. It's on this podcast together as part of a team. Yeah. And, and what's important is, do we agree on the core? And if we don't, 
well, you can go somewhere else and do something else. And and that we should like, that should be that, that kind of split, like in cryptocurrency, a fork. Like mm-hmm. when, if you notice any fork in cryptocurrency, when instead of fighting, the two sides just do their shit. Yeah. Like it actually works out More pretty natural. good. It's natural. That's, that's a natural yeah. law, right? Yeah. We need to honor one another's freedom and far too many people don't do that these days. But the more anarchy we get, the more agorism we get, the less divisive I think the general population will be because government is a one size fits all top down. Right. Like Trump gets an office. Monoculture. The Republicans shove all of their policies down on everyone, whether they agree or not. Biden or the Democrats get an office. They shove their policies on everyone, whether they agree or not. So the more agorism we have, the more decentralization, maybe it'll be easier to get along with people that don't agree with us. So in some ways, does it make a, does it make a government more vulnerable when they put in more regulations? If you know how to get around regulations, like isn't the entire gray market built on regulations and not following them yeah. so like do you think the average person in let's say colorado that was growing some pot in their their upstairs bedroom was really happy when colorado legalized you know recreational marijuana you think that was really good for them like there's a guy down the road for me he's only like three quarters of a mile down the road his house is actually across the street he partners with a dude down there that sells me cows and this guy sells fireworks and you can sell fireworks for two weeks in the summer and one week in the winter in Texas. And there's like, to get a permit to be one of those people, like somebody has to die or retire and sell their permit for you to get that permit. Now you'd think the people that sell fireworks would be the ones that are like, hey, you know, they should legalize fireworks. Nuh-uh. They're the ones that want that regulation to stay in place because yeah. they benefit Protectionism. From it. So that's protectionism. But when you operate outside that bubble – then do you not turn the apparatus of the state on all the people that are inside the apparatus? The guy that I can't think of his name, Michael, whatever, that was you know choked to death in New York for selling loose cigarettes. The only reason he had an opportunity to sell loose cigarettes in New York is because a pack of cigarettes is like 12 bucks or something. Like, I promise you, if you went downtown Fort Worth and you'd be like, hey, man, I sell cigarettes for a dollar a cigarette, people would be like, get away from me. What is wrong with you? <laughs> like, there's no opportunity to do that there. The more they do the more the opportunity actually exists if you understand how to work the system right. Yeah, and the okay, more Hawk. money you can make on it. Was, 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 was Hawk, Hawk going to jump in there before add. Jack went, uh, went on that one? Let him go. Well, no, I, it, it, I appreciate that. I think that it, 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 the theme of this conversation for me has been like, I want to stop being the guy on the mountain with just my family and my close community knowing that the beast is much bigger than I. And if it does come to the end of the world or Teotihuacan and you know, that shit comes to my door, like I may be, be very well outnumbered. And that is my primary concern. And how do we organize a bunch of anarchists who want like fucking leave me alone? How do we get, it's a miracle that the lights turn on to quote Jordan Peterson because we all hate each other. <laughs> um, <laughs> like hum- humans, humans generally, you get too many in a room and they start fighting. That's the way it goes. So like, how do we get all of those people who dislike themselves and each one of them, uh, everybody else to actually organize and work in a way that's not political and totally debasing the value of the human spirit? Well, I got, I got a plug for freedom cells. We're, we're... I was going to ask you, John, about the freedom cells because yeah. like, do you have like the same rule structure and everybody can do whatever the F they want as their own different cells? Yeah, well, really, so I'd invite everyone to check it out, freedomcells.org. One of the cool features when you sign up for the website, it's like a social media without Zuckerberg looking over. And I promise we're not going to Zuckerberg you. Um, And there's a member map. So a lot of people are always like, man, I don't know anyone in my area. I can't go meet anyone. I've gone to the meetups or whatever. Um, there's like 2,600 members now. So chances are, if you live near a major city, there's going to be people that you can connect with. But essentially what we tried to create was like an open source operating system of a social organization. And so it's not top down. It's not hierarchical. We encourage people to utilize the platform and this idea, however the hell they want. And the idea is you link up with around eight people, could be seven, could be 10, could be 12, could be whatever the hell you want, whatever variation or fork of the idea. And that's your inner cadre. You work together, you have mutual aid, you support one another, you work on common goals. Everyone gets three months worth of food storage. Everyone has firearms and learns how to use them. Maybe use the same caliber ammunition. Everyone has a bug out plan. Everyone has encrypted communication. And then this really jives and people have benefits in their lives. Then you encourage the creation of other groups 
And whenever you reach around eight groups of eight, 64 people, then you link up in what we call a middle cadre. And this is ideally in a local area. And then if you have other middle cadres forming across the state or across the country, they link up 64 groups of 64, which is like 544 and form what's called a meta cadre. And these groups all support one another. And there's a consensus making process that uh, could make decisions. There could be like a health share for healthcare that gets adopted. Uh, you know, it's in, it's in its early stages. And right now there's inner cadre groups. There's a bunch of them in Dallas, Fort Worth and Houston, some up in Canada and England, all across the world. And really it's in its infancy and people are just linking up in those first small groups and providing support one another and, and for one another. And one of the big benefits um, Derek Bros of the Conscious Resistance really grew a lot of this network. It was my idea back in 2014. He really pushed it. And a lot of his audience is really concerned with the growing technocracy, right? A lot of the stuff we talk about. And so one of the things that we want to do is build the community and the infrastructure so that if we don't get our COVID vaccine or we don't have our immunities and we can't show our green COVID pass on our phone or their little digital tattoo that they're going to do along with the vaccine, and we get shut out of the grocery store, it's like, hey man, I've been going to the grocery store for the past three months. We're linked up with all the local farms. We're growing our own food with our own little cadre group. So that's the idea. I wanna invite people to check it out, freedomcells.org. I think it's, a, it's something that we're doing to have the community that a lot of people are looking for and don't have. That's dope. I would love to, to have a, a private conversation with you about that and how we can organize, organize and bring like the, the whole fire on architecture with that. Because I think that that's crucial because there has to be like accountability at a community level. It's almost like the idea of politics is that there are somebody representing your, your voice instead of you. But with these things, we can represent our own damn voice right now. Yeah. Right. And if we had a, a trustworthy voting system, we could gauge the will of the population as a whole yes. immediately, asynchronously, make decisions based upon how everybody feels. We lost him again. And I'm telling you, man, there's something he's always on point. Every time they're they're on it, it, it on just <laughs> every time if, I if he back. flakes out, nothing happens. When he gets on it, it just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we your go. CI agent's way better at his job than mine is. I'm gonna yeah, tell he's you. On point. <laughs> we can, I've, I've theorized the decision making element of it, um, but we could definitely use an application to bring it to fruition, and that's. Uh, the yeah. cryptocurrency space is perfect for leveraging this in a decentralized dis de decision-making way. Okay, yep. so we're right on about an hour here, which is the length of the podcast. I want to just ask a question, go around the horn. And with this idea of status jujitsu and working around the system and using community, leveraging that power to privately interact with each other, how do you build trust beyond the one-to-one -one relationship? in your opinion. And I'm going to wait for somebody to raise their hand who wants to start first because Curtis, you got get it. Out. Okay. I'm going to keep it short too. You get out there and you do good. That's it. You just get out. You know, you, you, I saw this one, this kid once and he was, uh, it was like a video on YouTube, it, this little, this little black kid from some small town. And he was just like, how do I create value? He, he didn't really have much. He built a trailer of, of, for his bike out of two by fours and some like crappy radio flyer wheels, put a crappy lawnmower in there and just went door to door and added value. He just added, he did, he did this, right? And it's not that it's an act of generosity, but he's just doing stuff. But, you know, for kids who want to kind of get started and make their way, that's a great, kind of a great thing to do. But if you have the ability to give, just give and, and do it because there's a lesson in it for your children. It's, it's good to do. It's fun to do. You build rapport, just get out there and give. And when people talk to you and engage you, you know, our front garden is like that nonstop. It's just like people popping by asking questions. We give, we give in, in, in uh, just sometimes it's just words, right? It's words, advice, maybe it's money, hopefully not. Maybe it's something more meaningful, but that that's, that's how you do it. And that's at least one way to do it. Okay. John. Uh, well, back to the freedom cell. Um, I've speculated, theorized that this is how it could pan out. So you have your group of eight, which is your inner cadre. And obviously a small group of eight is capable of establishing trust with one another. Well, when you link up with the other groups of eight, you have to have trust with this initial group. And if there's ever problems that arise, so you have a group of 64 people and one of the members within one of these other groups is causing problems, the seven other groups of eight would essentially say, hey, 
Johnny in your inner cadre group has not been holding up to his obligations. He owes so-and-so some money over here. He was speaking some nasty words to this guy's wife over here. So you guys either need to get him in check, or if you can't, you either drop him from your group or we're going to disassociate from your cell. And then they essentially just shut them off. And then these guys have an incentive to either, you know, get this guy going, have him do some self-work, some inner healing, or cut him out because they're about to lose access to this group. And maybe even settle his debts for him. That's right. That's right. If they know he's in a hard spot, and that's how this whole mutual aid thing can work. Or maybe, I'm saying 64. maybe kick and settle. <laughs> kick and settle, yeah. Yeah. Heck yeah. So I don't know how it'll work, but that's just the speculation, and we want people to experiment with us and to bring it to reality. Jack, what do you think about trust? Well, it depends, right? So like if you're in – the real world i think that there is hardly anything that surmounts what curtis said so the kid that shows up every day and cuts your grass on the day he said he would do it and never does a bad job he's got trust and once he gets trust that gets handed on and it's really not that much different in the virtual world but if you think about it we buy things from people every day with no real assurance that they're going to send us anything or like that it's good Right. Or that it's good. Like we, you know, the reviews on Amazon are as good as you research them to be, but how many of you guys at some point or another in your daily life, you know, you're looking for something, it's not on Amazon or something where you have kind of a, an assurance that you'll get a refund and you find this company online and they sell this thing and you're like, that's the thing I need. And you buy it. And then it shows up. And we do that because we have various, trust mechanisms in place if we buy with a credit card it doesn't come we can reverse the charges if we buy through paypal we can dispute the charges we have all of these things well we have the ability to do all of that stuff with cryptocurrency so if i'm buying nicole's coffee and the only reason i'm buying it is i read some shit online that said nicole makes awesome coffee and she does and so i pay her for her coffee and, and her coffee doesn't show up do i really need to trust nicole or do I need to give Nicole the opportunity to earn my trust with some sort of mechanism to rectify the fact that she was untrustworthy? So when you do things like on a large scale with like smart contracts inside of cryptocurrency, like do we really need to worry about like how do we have to trust everybody? Isn't the entire purpose of, of cryptocurrency transactions to make transactions as trustless as possible? So that if I'm buying something from Xavier and he screws me, like I have recourse, maybe I have technological recourse where he doesn't even get my money or it's not money. We should never, Vin would like smite us all for calling crypto money, right? Like instead of you don't get my space credits until I get my thing. And then, then that gets executed on the back end. Do we have mechanisms for that? So I think that trust is earned the same way it's always been like Curtis started out with, that, that humans have earned trust forever. But at some point, if we're going to do business with each other across space and time, then we need mechanisms that allow us to do that as trustless as possible. And then once I get like, so even when I used to hire employees, like I would give every employee keys to my shop. They could come in three o'clock in the morning, clean the place out. Two days into it, seems like a, here's the keys to the place. And people thought that was crazy. We had a couple thousand bucks stolen one time in all the years that we did business and we knew who did it. And then we identified that person. That was so worth the trust that we extended to all those other people who felt like no employers ever trusted me this much before. And so the only way you actually gain trust is by somebody taking a risk on you in the first place. So one of the things I love about these mechanisms within payment systems is it allows me to extend trust with some recourse so that Xavier doesn't just seem trustworthy. After I've done business with him three or four times, I don't give a shit what Nicole says about Xavier. Doesn't matter to me. Every time I do business with Xavier, my shit shows up the way it's supposed to. I'm good. So that's kind of how I view the whole thing. Okay, Xavier. That's really good. I mean, all, all three of those are really poignant. And, and here we are in a technological age where on LinkedIn we get uh, endorsements from other people and how do you know if those people are good you, you know I've been talking about a social merit system for a very long time but you quickly go into the black mirror territory where it's like oh you can't go to the wedding you know from that episode I don't know if you had a that was awful that. it was horrible and, and like but I could look at it and because I designed a system that does that and I'm like ooh, that you know if, if just if the controls of that were within the hands of the people 
and, and, and really facilitated what you're talking about, Jack, like the ability to trust and take a risk and mitigate the, re the, the recourse in such a way that like, okay, so I took that risk and something bad happened. If we can mitigate that, then we can encourage a culture of trust. And what that does is that creates an upliftment of humanity. We stop acting like animals fighting over bones and sticks and meat and, and, and other things and we, and we start behaving, you know, in a way that's, that feels more heavenly. Um, and that's, that's, so when I, when I think about trust, I think about how can we make trust more transparent? We're in an age where there is no privacy anymore, um, but who controls that? So if that system's being built, it's already in deployment in China. And if we talk about, you know, skirting things here in the United States, we have the freedom still to do that. Over there, they do not. You know, that, that's where the beast is too big and you can't, you just become like organ fodder, you know? So I, I'm going to say, though, I bet you there's more agorism in China than there is in the United States. Yeah, probably. Uh, yeah, yeah, black market stuff for sure, yeah. you know? But then even that, like if you become a big enough black market operator, you're owned by the state. But even more by the balls, you know, my aunt is even more by the balls at that point. But um, I just wanted to give a real quick shout out to Doomsayer and to John Bush, Hand Drawn Bear, and all the folks who've given us questions. Like I really, I've been in, really enjoying the fact that we're getting some some really good uh, interaction here. Yeah. Maybe next week we'll do more of those since we yeah. didn't yeah. do that many this week. Yeah, there's a lot of people watching live too. So shout out to the YouTube live audience on Curtis' yeah, thank page. You guys thanks so for much. thanks for letting us stream on your channel there, Curtis. Yeah, so my pleasure to, to wrap up um, futility of politics and utility of community as our topic kind of went down some interesting roads. I thought we were going to talk about the uh, the coming civil war in Portland. So maybe we can put that one off till uh, next. We'll talk about next, civil war another next time. Next week. Um, I'm down. I mean, we've trust, got a couple months. Trust, I think, is something that as agorists and as we develop as our own community, we can we can reinforce by setting the right culture, right? So we've been building out the social media and we've had a couple of crazies and they're gone. And I think if we keep a community of agorists who understand the core philosophy or, or, or are learning about it, maybe they're not agorists when they come in, you get to a point where you can have that fence post transaction because I think part of trust is the, the, the private exchange that does not require the certification documentation document from the government right if you don't require that i'm usda certified with my coffee and you're just going to buy my coffee and it's private that works it doesn't work if somebody decides i have to have that for them to get it and then they bring in you know they call in the cops that just to use a very personal example and there are so many people trading you know soap for um canned goods or canned goods for fresh vegetables or, or all of these other things that technically if the government decided to get involved they'd come down and smack you and it's the trust of not reporting it's it's that understanding the difference between what the law is and what right is that but doesn't that get created difference? because you did it right so what i mean is like remember underground metery nicole it kind of fizzled out. Yeah. Do you remember that though? Michael yeah. Jordan, not the basketball guy, one of our folks <laughs> from our Michael community, Jordan. right? Yeah. The, Be careful the big what you giant drink guy, from that man. The big guy, <laughs> the big giant guy who can break your fingers by shaking your hand from Wyoming mm -hmm. created this thing called underground meadery. And then he, he came to my workshops. He taught everybody how to make mead so that everybody knew how to make mead and they could be part of the underground meadery. And yeah. there were, there was meat going all over the country in the underground meadery right in front of everybody. And nobody mm -hmm. did shit. And there were guys that actually ended up starting small commercial meaderies out of that. And even though that thing kind of like it ran its course and did its thing, I know for a fact, because I have some of them, there are relationships that were created in that community that are still doing, and they might not be exchanging mead now, but they're exchanging something. Something. Right. Play and like, I think by creating whatever. these these rogue communities you create these relationships that are so strong that like maybe they're part of one john of john's freedom cells maybe they're like i don't want a freedom cell it doesn't matter what matters is that relationship is formed and that is that is something that supersedes anything government can do like government can't really get in the way of that they can try 
But the only way, like, is what that Nicole was hitting on there. Like, the only way that the government gets in a transaction between me and Nicole is if one of us becomes dissatisfied and sees government as the recourse. And that's why I've always had in my contracts that you must first seek non binding uh, 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 resolution and then you can seek uh, a binding resolution. And then, only then, if somebody won't abide by the binding resolution and in and, and arbitration, then you can go to the state to enforce something that's already been decided. And in all my years of doing business, I've never been past non-binding arbitration. Because as soon as somebody that's a third party that has, and you say it has to be agreed upon, both people agree, hey, Nicole's impartial, Xavier and I can't agree on something. We're going to talk to Nicole. Nicole's going to have a pro proposed solution. We kind of look at it and go, if we went to a binding arbitrator, they're probably going to say the same thing, and that's going to cost us money. Yeah, that's true. So screw that. Let's just do what Nicole said. Or we'll, Xavier and I go, you know what? Nicole's kind of batty. You know, Guys, I, I got to go could... to dinner. My wife is giving me terrible looks right that's now. That's awesome. Yeah, my that's kids are screaming. The real boss. Absolute pandemonium here, man. <laughs> okay, so but, we'll wrap up. Um, yeah. We'll continue this conversation next week on the fourth episode of Unloose the Goose. If there are topics you want to hear us about, let us know. We've got a Facebook group. It's Unloose the Goose. And then we also have Twitter, Unloose the Goose. I will be setting up the MeWe group this week. And of course, our YouTube channel is Unloose the Goose on YouTube. All of it's really easy to find. If you go to unloosethegoose.com, it links you straight over to social. And I just want to thank everybody for being on and Telegram. Tonight. Telegram groups. Telegram. We're on Telegram. We've got a Telegram group too. So lots of ways to interact with us, but you can leave us alone too. Have a great <laughs> night. Have a good night, guys. Bye. Right, peace. <laughs> There's the little one. Okay. Curtis, you're free. Can we shut off the YouTube? Not yet. <laughs>